You know, it is a, to me, it is, and I know, I, I believe you feel the same way. It's a, it's a marvelous, miraculous thing to be able to go to an Old Testament book like this and see the glory of the person and work of Christ. Uh, the Lord, you know, we have his, his words uh, uh, as a basis to do this. We're not spiritualizing. We're not reading into the book something that's not there because Christ, he told the Pharisees who, who, were, who uh, imagined themselves to be masters of the scriptures. He said, they are they which testify of me. And here in this passage, we have the, bride, the bridegroom, which is Christ, the bridegroom of his bride, the church. We have the bridegroom speaking to his bride, and he calls her a dove. Verse 14, O oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock. And I entitle this lesson, as you can see, The Dove Hidden in the Rock. And what a beautiful picture that is of our salvation in Christ. By Christ, by his grace, we're hidden in the cleft of the rock. And that rock is Christ. And we need to be hidden there. Now, hidden doesn't mean hidden from view. It means hidden in the way of protection, in the way of preservation, in the way of salvation. Nothing can touch us as far as breaking our fellowship and right relationship with God. Because we have Christ. And we can't even do it ourselves. That, that, to me, that's a comforting thing. You know, if, if God didn't, he saves us, we know that by his grace. But he keeps us by his grace. He preserves us. You know, the old, uh, uh, when we talk about the, the tulip, you know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace. And then it says perseverance of the saints. I like to make that be preservation of the saints. And preservation is by means. God uses means, the means of his word. And we do, by his grace and power, persevere. But we persevere in Christ. He is our hope. He is our state. He is our righteousness. And, you know, when, uh, when we look at the, in Ephesians 6, for example, put on the whole armor of God. Well, every bit of that armor... Is, is, is a facet of God's power, God's goodness, and God's grace given us freely in Christ. It's not something we create or that we muster up within ourselves or by our own power. It's all Christ. It's all God's grace. And that's how we withstand the wiles of the devil. That's how we come against the world and our own flesh, by looking at this. So here's the bridegroom. Uh, Speaking the sweet, uh, in a sweet voice to his bride. Oh, my dove. And you know the dove is an appropriate symbol here when we talk about what a Christian is and what salvation is. A dove, uh, 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 remember this bride, this dove that he says, that's every sinner saved by the grace of God. If you're a believer, you've been made so, not by your own will or free will or whatever they call it. Not by your own goodness. You've been made so by the grace and power of God. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto, not because of, but unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so his bride consists, it, it's the church. It's uh, uh, all who have been justified freely. Think about that. What is it to be justified? <laughs> it's to be righteous in God's sight. It's to be not guilty. It's to be, listen, it means sin cannot be charged to my account. Am I a sinner? Yes. Are you sinners? Yes. But because of the blood of Christ, because of his substitutionary work on the cross, which we're going to talk about today, it is finished. Because of that, God cannot and will not impute or charge or account sin to us. We're hidden in the rock. <laughs> the rock Christ Jesus. Our sins have been washed away. What does that mean? 
Does that mean he took a bar of soap and scrubbed us real good like mama used to do when we were muddy, dirty kids? No. It means he went to the cross and shed his blood to make the payment of our sin debt, and he did it in full. And therefore, there's no payment left to pay. We found, we're like Job, we found a ransom. <laughs> and it's a complete ransom. This, this dove includes all who are sanctified by the grace of God. What is it to be sanctified? It's to be set apart. That's what sanctified means. It does, listen, if it, uh, most people when they look at sanctification or holiness, they think of moral purity. If that's what it is, can we say we're sanctified? No. No. We're sanctified. We were, and think about this. How long our bridegroom has loved his bride. Everlasting love. We were set apart by God the Father in sovereign electing grace before the foundation of the world. Why did he set me apart from the vessels of wrath? I don't know. The only answer Christ gives, I think, is in Matthew chapter 11. Well, he, he, there's two answers, Romans 9 and Matthew 11. Romans 9, it's for the glory of God. Matthew 11, it seemed good in his sight. Now, that doesn't mean I seemed good in his sight because I wasn't. And the whole point in Romans 9 there is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth me. It's sovereign mercy. We were set apart by God. In redemptive grace, when Christ died for us at the cross, he died as a surety. Our sins imputed to him, his righteousness to us, he died as a substitute. He took my place. He bore my iniquities. He took my guilt. All of that. He was made a curse. The curse that I earned and deserved, he was made a curse for me. And see, all of this are elements of being hidden in the rock, the rock Christ Jesus. And he set us apart in regenerating grace when he called us out of the, he gave us life, raised us from the dead. Lazarus, come forth. We were talking about that last night. Lazarus, come forth. In the preaching of the gospel, that's what he did to us, giving us life and calling us out of the world and into his, his uh, rock, him the rock hidden in the rock, into the sheepfold, into his church. So they, and this dove includes all who abide in him continually by his power and grace because he keeps us under his gracious, loving, sovereign care. He won't let us go. He won't let us go. We're held captive by him, but it's a lovely being captive, isn't it? It's where we want to be. It's not like being in the jailhouse of the law <laughs> that condemns us. We're not on death row. <laughs> We're in Christ awaiting his return, awaiting our going to him or his return, either one. So here he compares his bride to a dove, a dove for her beauty. You ever seen a white dove? <laughs> Beautiful bird. But it's a beauty that he created for us. It's not a beauty that we had naturally. If you want to see what we have naturally, uh, read passages like Isaiah chapter 1. <laughs> Putrefying sores from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. That's us naturally. But what did he do? He cleaned that up and gave us a white robe of righteousness and gave us his grace within. That is a beautiful thing. And even though we're still sinners and still have the warfare of the flesh and the spirit... We have a heart that God has given us to look to Christ that, that by which the Spirit continually convicts us of sin. And so the dove's beauty is, is uh, set forth. The dove's innocence is set forth. The dove's not a bird of prey. The dove's not one of those birds that swoops down and, and kills its prey. The dove is not one who feeds upon the dead, a, you know, what they call it, a scavenger or like a buzzard. The dove, is a, the dove is an innocent bird. The dove is usually the prey. And this innocence, again, that, this innocence is not of us naturally. We're not innocent in that sense. 
Again, we're sinners. What is a sinner? One who commits sin. But we're innocent in Christ. Again, no sin can be charged to us. We've been washed through and through by the blood of the Lamb. And He is our innocence. We're not guilty because of Him and what He accomplished. And the dove is a good symbol because it represents humility. By nature, we're not humble, we're proud. Every time, and you know, here's the thing about it. Men and women, some men and women can appear humble before men. And they can even be humble before men. But until you see yourself by the spirit of God's revelation as a sinner who can do nothing to recommend yourself unto God. And then you see that the only thing that can save you is the sovereign grace and mercy of God in Christ. Until you see that, you're not humble before God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Scripture says that means there's no humility, no meekness, no, no understanding, no worship. And so the dove is, is that symbol of humility. God makes us willing in the day of his power to submit to his will and his way of salvation by grace. And then the dove is a symbol of peace. That's probably the major symbol, uh, symbolism in the dove. And Christ is at peace with his people. God is at peace. Think about that. God is at peace with sinners. Why? Because God is a judge. He's a righteous judge. He must punish sin. Let me put it this way. You know, it's common for people to, today in religion who call themselves Christian. They say, well, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Or God punishes the sin, but not the... Listen, God must punish sinners to whom sin is charged. Isn't that right? If, you know, that's why David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And if we can't be charged with sin, God cannot and will not punish us. He'll bless us. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again and is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to do what? To make intercession for us. Christ is our peace with God. He's the, that's why he's called the Prince of Peace. Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem is the city of peace. And la uh, later on in Song of Solomon, we're going to see Solomon himself as a type of Christ. And I thought about this. You know, David, King David, Solomon's father, wanted to build a temple to the Lord. But the Lord wouldn't let him. And you know why he wouldn't let him? Because David was a man of war, a man of blood. David was a fighter. David was a type of Christ fighting against the uh, powers of, the, of, of darkness. And that's what Christ did. And that's what he was doing on the cross. He's in a warfare on the cross. And that's what David represents. Christ warring. Christ working. Solomon was allowed to build the temple, and you know why? Because he was a man of rest. I'll show you the scriptures on that later when we get to that passage. A man of peace. He represents Christ in his finished warfare, his finished work. And Solomon was given the task to build the temple. But here's the point. The safety and the security of the dove, of the church, the bride is in, in the fact that she's hidden in the clefts of the rock. Look at it, the clefts of the rock. What's a cleft? Well, it's, a, it's like a fissure. It's like a, like a rift, a break. One commentator said that the clefts, the, the breaks, speaks of the wounds of Christ. His body, which is broken for us, and his suffering unto death leading up to and upon the cross when he died for our sins. 
He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. The payment of our sins. He was wounded, Isaiah said, for our transgressions. Bruised, crushed is what that literally is. When it says bruised, it means crushed. He was crushed for our iniquities. You remember when Moses was commanded of God to strike the rock so that the children of Israel could have water? And Moses struck the rock and water poured from That rock was Christ. And of course, you remember when Moses later on got angry at the people and struck the rock again. God didn't say strike the rock again. He said, speak to the rock. <laughs> the rock was only to be struck one time. Christ only died one time. You know what the Catholic Mass is? It's almost like it's in symbol, isn't it, I believe? Re, uh, uh, re-crucifying Christ. No, that's blasphemy. Blasphemy. And his death, one, by one offering, he hath what? Perfected them forever that are sanctified. By his one offering. And so... Moses struck the rock twice and and God punished him for it because he misrepresented the glory of God in Christ. And then you remember even before that when Moses was, when God, when the Lord was speaking to Moses and Moses said, show me your glory. God said, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock (laughs) and I'll pass by. And that's when he said, I'll be gracious to whom I will be. I'll be merciful to whom I will be. And that's Christ. That's Christ. You know, we're hidden safely and securely in the rock. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to escape the the storms of this life, the chastisements of God. We're going to have trouble in this world, but we're still hidden in the cleft of the rock. Christ said, I've overcome the world. Satan had to ask permission to touch Job. And he could touch Job's body, but he couldn't touch Job's soul, could he? Because Job was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And then he says here in verse 14, he says, O my dove, thou that that are in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Don't think of this as a a staircase with a room underneath it and you're hidden underneath it. No, what this is, is climbing up the stairs Christ is the stairway, the steps rather, by which believers go to God, ascend up to God. We have access and communion with God through Christ. He is the way. Think about Jacob's ladder, for example. That's what he was showing there, that the way for a sinner like Jacob to get to God was this ladder. And that ladder represents Christ, the way of God. The way of grace. All of that. And he says, uh, he says, left, uh, he says, the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, thy face, thy glory. Let me hear thy voice, thy word. This, this, this is uh, the bridegroom wanting to see the face of his bride. Why? Because her face reflects His glory. (laughs) We've seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when he brings us to a saving knowledge of that glory, what do we do? In our voice. He wants to hear her voice. What does he want to hear? He wants to hear praises. Worship to him. That's his work. (laughs) We're his workmanship, you see. And he says, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely, beautiful. Why? A sinner? In his sight. Isn't that it? Isn't this the issue? How how the bride appears in the sight of God? Not in the sight of men now. You look at at us uh, on our outward appearance, growing old. Headed for death, this body is dead because of sin. But you don't see the inner man, do you? That's what Paul said in Romans 7, the inner man. Our heart of hearts, the new heart that causes us to cling to Christ. 
And that's his power, that's his grace, that's his beauty. Look at verse 15. Take us the little fo the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The, the fox, you know, the fox is noted as, uh, symbolically as being a sly and cunning animal. Always seek to ruin and their enemies and feed upon their prey. They spoil the vines. But they can't spoil the vine. Our vine is Christ. I am the vine. You're the branches. And neither can they spoil his church. The gates of hell will not prevail. And these foxes, I believe, represent false preachers, false believers, who, who uh, stealthily creep within the church and try to spoil the work of God. They cannot, they cannot accomplish it. But I've got a, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about these foxes, these false teachers who come in the name of Christ but deny his doctrine. Now, mark that down in your minds. Uh, uh, the false, te you know, I, I think about this all the time because you can, you know, you can turn on the TV and you can see all kinds of preachers preaching, claiming to preach Christ. Some of them are closer than others. There's, there's some who are just so off the wall. I remember years ago, uh, uh, somebody showed, this is even before I was converted, showed me a, this guy over in Alabama named the Reverend Ike. I don't know if you remember him. But he was all about making money. That's all he talked about. Well, he didn't even fool me when I was a lost man. But now, once we know the truth, we find that there are some who are closer, more subtle, like foxes, wolves in sheep's clothing. That kind of thing. Uh, Christ said in the last days, some will be so close that if it were possible, they could what? Deceive the very elect. Thank God it's not possible that the elect stay deceived, remain deceived unto death because God's going to turn on the light in their case. But we have to be on our toes. We have to be what the writer of Hebrews called skillful in the word of righteousness to discern good and evil. And I've got a list of scriptures here about false prophets, but I want you to turn to one. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to show you something here. This is in 2 Corinthians 11. And in verse 2. And the apostle writes here in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. He said, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. And I think about, you know, how, how we ought to be jealous of each other with a godly jealousy. I don't want to deceive you, and you don't want to be deceived. And he says, for I have espoused you to one husband. Now, what are we talking about? The dove and the, this whole song of Solomon. It's Christ the bridegroom, his church the bride, Christ the husband, his church the wife. And Paul says, I have espoused you to one husband. How did Paul espouse them to one husband? Preaching the gospel. You want to hear the, wed the wedding vows between the bride and the bridegroom? Preach the gospel. <laughs> Point sinners to Christ. Tell them who Christ is and tell them what Christ has done <laughs> in establishing the only work, the only righteousness that God will accept. And he said, I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, pure in Christ. But I fear, he says in verse 3, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. And now, now you remember what serpent, the serpent did. You know, he quoted scripture. He, he, brought, in, he brought in what God, hath God not said. Hath God said. Through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What is that simplicity that's in Christ? Well, they used to call some gospel preachers Johnny One Notes. They have one message. We preach Christ. Everything is in Christ. Everything is by Christ. If you want to go on to other things, you better go out the door here. Because I'm, not, I'm preaching the gospel. Now, I do preach other things in light of the gospel. But everything that we are and everything that we have by way of salvation, by way of a right relationship with God, is in this single person based upon this single work, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when false preachers try to divert your minds away from that, that's what Paul's talking about. That's these little foxes. Go back to Song of Solomon, verse 16. Now, here's the, here's the word. This is the language of a wedding vow. My beloved is mine and I am his. That's what the bride said. He's mine, I'm his. God said when he uh, gave the prophecy of the new covenant, they shall, be my, I, they shall be my people and I'll be their God. That's the wedding vow. Union with God in Christ. And he feedeth among the lilies. That's among the people of God. That's what we're doing now. We're feeding among the lilies. We're hearing the word of God. We're like sheep in the fold, grazing upon the lush green grass, drinking from the water. And he says in verse 17, until the day break and the shadows flee away. The day break is when the light comes. I believe specifically he's talking here about the second coming. But anytime we're in the shadows, we're in the shadows of doubt, the shadows of pain, anytime like that, and Christ reveals himself anew. We get a fresh revelation, a fresh sight of his glory. That's the day breaking. And he says, turn my beloved and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. The mountains, uh, that word means division. In other words, come and bring us into your fold again, uh, back into your fold. Not that we leave the fold or lose salvation, but he brings us into his love, a fresh realization of these things. And what he's talking about is how we're dependent upon the bridegroom at all times. We're dependent, and we wait for his appearing. That's what we're doing now. All right, let's we'll end right there.